Welcome back to Bay Area Pride. Today we have a special episode. We have someone who's maybe not native, maybe doesn't live in the Bay Area, but will be here soon on her comedy tour, Must See Ashley Gavin, podcaster, comedian, writer, uh, known for, and I found her through her podcast, We're Having Gay Sex, which is just a fantastic interview show with some of the funnest people that you'll ever see. So without further ado, Ashley, Thanks for being here with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for having me. The The Bay Area shares a funny little place in my heart. Oh, really? Uh, so I'm excited. When, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When did you first visit? Well, I seriously dated a woman from the Bay Area for okay. a long time, for six years. Um, but also, I used to be a software engineer. Mm -hmm. And I used to, you know, go to the Bay Area for work. And I... I didn't hate the Bay Area, but I did hate the work. <laughs> so I always wanted to visit as a regular person. And now I finally get to. Wonderful, wonderful. And so, um, yeah, I love the Bay Area. Um, and yeah, software engineering. I understand why that might be a little tough. But I want to pull that back because your podcast is how a lot of people find you, especially through TikTok, which is how I believe I found your podcast as well about a year ago or so was through your TikTok clips. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. Uh, let me check this out. And then I was just, of course, started ravenously listening because you can't stop once you start. And I wanted to go back uh, because we're a lot about the journey here. We have a lot of young artists, people who are just starting off. And do you remember your first podcast episode and what was the situation surrounding? that oh my god my first that is a crazy question no one has ever asked me that and Thank there's you. a good story behind it so when I was first getting started you know I had a background in tech so I was, I was producing myself and I was like I can handle this I can do it but the the system that I had researched heavily because I knew I wanted a soundboard mm -hmm. on my show and you know sometimes it works now it always works <laughs> but like sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't in the early episodes because we have right. no producer and it's just kind of like what it is mm -hmm. but i found this system that use you could hook up a soundboard so that i was very dedicated to that system but for some reason it just does not play well with a mac computer which is what i had no. so it, it just kept breaking and i thought you know what i'm just gonna go for it i just need to pull the trigger and record my first episode and I booked Chris Chris Burns, a.k.a. Fat Cri Carrie Bradshaw, um, comedy <laughs> drag queen. She's hilarious. I almost cursed. She's so, so, so funny. And I was like, we have to record and just get this out there. Of course, it breaks in the middle of the thing. Of course. I pull out every piece of audio equipment that I have to like try and record something. Mm -hmm. no, the recording is horrible. Like The quality is just like totally unreleasable. Like, the worst so we never released that episode we had to re-record it later on with chris and bring him back mm -hmm. to re-record so i don't know if that inspires anybody <laughs> but like it was a it was a mess it was like a total mess yeah yeah i think honestly for me that's a bit inspiring because even though you weren't fully set up and things weren't perfect you still pulled the trigger like if every yeah, situation was <laughs> exactly it didn't work and look at you now though like it didn't work and then look at your podcast now like, look how much it's, it's flourishing. True. And so I, I love that, Sora, because most of the time, the first thing doesn't work. It just it just falls flat completely. And um, that and doesn't you, determine your you success. You work so hard to make something perfect, mm -hmm. especially, like, I think people who are femme or, like, raised female or mm -hmm. female identifying, like, whatever terms, like, resonate with you. I think if you grow up femme, <laughs> you're socialized, like, you want it to be perfect all the time. Right. You know, and and so instead of doing that, it would have been, I think, more productive for me to have just started before. Well, that's ultimately what I arrived at. Mm -hmm. But I spent a lot of time doing practice episodes, blah, blah, blah. And I just like really didn't need to be doing them. What I needed to do was just start. Yep. Yep. I remember my first interview ever on a podcast and it just wasn't, it just wasn't good. It wasn't bad, but it just wasn't good. I had no idea how anything worked yet, you know, and then especially with podcasting is you're constantly like doing tech while you're running the podcast. It's not fun. Now I have everything set beforehand, an hour beforehand, and I'm chilling. It's great. Uh, but I wanted to bring it. So looking at you now, you're 116 episodes in somewhere around there. I think that's where we're at. That sounds uh, right. 
And um, what do you, in your mind, what's the biggest difference between that first episode or the first released episode and now when you run your podcast? Man, well, I'm better, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I'm funnier off the cuff. Like you practice for an hour, several times a week, just being funny off the cuff. You just get better, <laughs> right? you know? And I think also like the listener feedback has helped me so much understand and also the TikTok feedback, even though that's not explicitly about the podcast itself, mm-hmm. people who interact with the clips or people who just even interact with my standup informs how I understand people are perceiving the podcast. So now that I've practiced being funny in this particular way, gotten the feedback, and then you go into the next episode and you can hear the jokes forming and you're like, oh, this is the type of thing that people, I can feel their reaction. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I can feel how they're responding to this in the moment and you kind of, Sometimes you know and sometimes you don't know, but you get better and better at predicting and you kind of like know what avenues to travel down. And that's like really important in improvising comedy, like knowing where there's a possible dead end and knowing where, oh, this could lead you on a really fun adventure and being able to identify the difference. I've gotten more skilled at that as well. Uh, Yes, and I think that's directly ready to stand up right it's a, it's it's feeding it's feeding off the crowd it's feeling the tension and then knowing knowing that you're going to build up to this certain joke and then it's all that tension is going to release right and you yeah. can do that but without a live audience or a semi live audience with your co-host and then your guests yes and the guests and the future live audience i can i can feel them now it's so weird i can even feel it on tiktok like mm-hmm. when i'm doing stand up i'm like Oh, this is a TikTok <laughs> clip. I can like I can feel it in my and I never used to, I had no idea mm-hmm. before. You said that like you did not know that in the beginning. So we're not dealing with like a oh pure talent, pure skill. I just know how to do this. <laughs> it's experience and it's learning and it's examining uh your mistakes. Do you listen back to your podcasts at all? And like look for different uh, ways you could do better? Well, I used to edit them. So okay. I listen, not only <laughs> did brutal. I listen back to them, but I listen back to them very closely and many mm-hmm. times. Um, now, now I don't. And sometimes I think I really need to be listening back to them more. Every now and then Alex will edit. Alex is my <laughs> editor and he's a, my producer as well. And he's wonderful. But every now and then Alex will do one. Uh, we'll do an episode and I'll say, I'd like to listen back to that one because there were some, you know, maybe I didn't like the way I phrased something or maybe there was something that, you know, like could be triggering to somebody in some right. way. And you don't want to put, not that you're, you've done anything necessarily wrong, but like there's no point in risking someone's mental health for like mm-hmm. a, like a joke or like whatever. So sometimes I'll go back and listen if I'm worried about something, but Actually, I'm lying. Every now and then I do. <laughs> this is this is going to sound so arrogant, but every now and then I I've forgotten what an episode is it because mm-hmm. I don't listen back and I I actually can listen to them and enjoy them now. That's wonderful. Which which is really nice. Yeah, that, that but... I don't think that's arrogant at all. I think that's great. And I'm so glad you brought up the mental health portion because I wanted to touch on that anyway. Is that you have a very I would I would describe it as a bit abrasive style of comedy. Uh, well, you're on. What? <laughs> <laughs> when you're on stage, you re- you react with the crowd very well, and um, you have and then some of your clips on your TikTok or Instagram, uh, you can see you know you're you're messing with people, you're engaging with the audience, you're doing some crowd work, but at the same time, I had such a deep appre- appreciation when I started listening to your podcast, and I saw just how kind and caring you were, like in the middle of it, like checking in and making sure wait. Is this too far? Or is like, is this, did I say this wrong? Wait, I'm phrasing this wrong in my head. And like, sometimes I notice like, it's very rare, but sometimes I'll just see like pure cuts, even in like the uncut video. Yeah. Going, like going to the mental health portion, for me, as someone who does a lot of speaking, not necessarily comedy, was it difficult to find that balance between being yourself and, and like having a joke that you know would get a laugh, but then maybe wouldn't, it wouldn't be the right thing to say? Like, what was that decision process look and how did you um, like evolve and teach yourself how to go through that? Well, I think some of it is actually, 
I'm going to be a little vulnerable here, but I think mm-hmm. all of us, when we're joking with our friends, because that's how most people joke, right? It's with their friends, not professionally, not on a podcast, nothing like that. Maybe in a work setting. You joke really differently in a work setting than you do with your friends. And I don't mean that the jokes with your friends are necessarily inappropriate, <laughs> but they might be more on the line than you would do at work, right? And yeah. that is true in stand-up, in podcasting, in whatever type of environment that you're going to be in. And you're not necessarily making jokes that are inappropriate or offensive or wrong, but you're thinking, how well does this person know me? Because when you're joking with your significant other, they know you and they, you know each other's boundaries, you know each other's triggers, you know when the other person is like totally just messing around and Mm -hmm. could not possibly mean the thing that she's saying Mm -hmm. versus someone who could misinterpret that, right? And so when you're doing comedy, part of it is about trust level between you and the audience. And definitely as I've been doing the podcast more and more and more, the, I have noticed that the audience has grown to trust me more just based on reading the comments and stuff like that. And so I have a really fine tuned sense of the things that they're going to respond to or not respond to. And to me, no joke is ever worth hurting someone. Um, and if I, if I do hurt someone, it has to be inadvertent. And I'm happy to apologize. You know what I mean? Everybody can get hurt by different things. So it's hard to know. But that's why I listen back and cut certain things. Because it's like, it might feel funny to me in the moment. It might have been funny between me and Kate or me and Gara. Mm -hmm. But like, I'm realizing, you know what? This particular joke, I don't necessarily stand by that for a mass audience because this could potentially hurt somebody. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's a very responsible, like mature way to handle an art form. It's just, and it's like, it's a communic, it's a communication um, development that I think many people should learn how to do. Uh, I, I hope people don't think I'm saying crazy things in my No, <laughs> in no, my no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Cause I think, and especially like from a queer perspective too, like with my trans friends, like I was, I, I had a trans roommate at one point and one time I walked out of my room and I saw her and a bunch of other v- very queer people. And she goes, and she looks at me, she goes, this is Lilith, she's transsexual. And uh, like, and that's like, and then we all start laughing together because it's very clearly, it's a bunch of queer people making fun of ourselves using language yes. that we would never use in like yes. a real setting. That's a great example. Another example is just like gay people hanging out saying homophobic things to exactly, each other. Like, exactly. It's, th- it's yeah. different as long as everyone's in on the joke, then everyone's in on the joke right. and no one's getting hurt. Um, right, exactly. And when you're on stage, and, though, and not knowing the people individually, right, it right. gets a lot tougher. And that's why you need audiences to warm up, too. Audiences can mm-hmm. change in, in an hour. By the end right. of the hour, they trust you more. You know, this isn't to say, this is not like a what we're discussing right now isn't like, I'm not talking about PC comedy. Like mm-hmm. there are definitely hard lines about things that certain people can say and other yeah, people can't say, course. blah, blah, blah. What we're talking about is like, it, communication is exactly mm-hmm. what you're like, that's exactly what it is. And it's it's fascinating. And it's fascinating how different it is on the podcast versus on stage. Some ways I get away with, it more on stage because <laughs> it's real life and you can hear people laughing exactly you're not alone you're not isolated exactly yeah which is why going and seeing a comedy show live is a lot better than going on netflix and seeing it because you don't it's not it's just not the same you don't have the back and forth with the comedian uh, people say to me all the time i don't like comedy i'm like well have you gone live exactly because it's 100 percent. i think one of the craziest difference in any other art form like visual performance art form i think comedy is one of those ones where it's like oh this is night and day they're totally different Mm -hmm. it's so much better live oh you can see bad comedy live (laughs) exactly because you're you and you can see good comedy on time yeah and good comedy on netflix is sometimes bad like it's crazy (laughs) it's really crazy um but i wanted so we're like we're we're 
two thirds of the way through already. Like, it happened so fast. How is fast. that possible? It just, you're, you're so easy to talk to, Willis. <laughs> you're too entertaining, what an actually. Uh, but I wanted to, I want to go back because we talked a bit, like, from the artist's perspective of like responsibility and communication, uh, which I see relates to a lot of different art forms and expressing yourself, but also being aware of who you're expressing yourself to. But going back, it's really difficult to start off from that start of the comedy journey. Was that a side hustle and figure out what you wanted to do? And, and like, how did you support yourself uh, emotionally more so during that time? Well, when I started comedy, I, I had I have, a you know, a lot of privileges that I don't think a lot of other comedians had. The biggest one is that I grew up in New York City. My mother lived in New York City mm -hmm. and I was able to live at home. Mm -hmm. during the beginning of my comedy journey, which was just huge because I had a full-time job, but I wasn't paying rent. So every dollar that I made in the, I, I, you know, I barely spent anything really in the back of my mind. I think I always knew there was going to be a jumping off point where I would try to go full-time in comedy, no matter what that salary looked like. And it went okay. The first two or three years, I think I blew through my entire savings just on trying to pay rent. Um, and doing like college gigs. And eventually I booked these cruise gigs that really like financially were like, oh, thank God, because the savings were dwindling and the college money was so um, unreliable and cruise gigs are super reliable. Like you get minimum of two every month when you start and then you can jump up to like four or something. Um, so I was really lucky in that regard. Emotionally, it sucked to live with my mother um, that was really, that was really tough, especially when I went through my breakup with the girl that I was seeing from the Bay area and I wanted to start dating. It was, that was really tough. And to mm -hmm. explain to people, oh, I'm a comedian and I live at home with my mom. They're mm -hmm. like, okay. <laughs> You're like, no, but I'm, I'm really good. No, I'm, I'm not one of those. I'm actually, I'm actually good. <laughs> right. I know many, um, artists that I know personally in the queer community and the PFLAG community here who are incredibly talented, incredibly dedicated, and it's incredibly difficult to commit to that, um, and find your place. So just as we're wrapping up here, do you have some words to some of our, some of our artists, honestly, of all ages that in our PFLAG community here in San Francisco, do you have some just words of wisdom, hope? Brutal realism. Uh... Yeah, probably brutal realism. <laughs> I mean, anyone who knows me well knows that like, if I could, my long period of being what I felt was very good at comedy to recognition was like the most grueling. Like I was, you know, I was depressed. I was like right. fully depressed, suicidal ideation, like not in a good place. I mean, the thing that changed everything for me was TikTok. But TikTok only happened because a year or maybe even a year and a half prior to that, I had fully given up on Hollywood taking me serious, like fully given up. And, you know, people were starting to pop off on the Internet a little bit in the comedy space. And everyone had seen me. Comedy Central had seen me. Netflix had seen me. Everyone had seen me. So this was not an issue of like being found. Right. This was they they straight up were like, nah. Mm -hmm. So that when I decided I don't want to deal with these people, I'm going to do this on my own. And I started filming every single set that I had. Then when TikTok rolled around, all of a sudden I had hours and hours and hours of footage just ready to go. So, you know, that's a little bit of luck that TikTok worked out to me. But I think no matter what platform it would have been, I had the footage ready to go on the Internet and I think if you can find in your, I know every craft is different and you can't always use the internet, but like we are very lucky that for many crafts, there is an avenue that you can go straight to the people, whether it's Patreon or YouTube or whatever. Like we're very lucky to be artists living in this time because there is an independent way to move forward. And I don't, I recommend it to everybody. Like, don't let anyone gatekeep your art because they don't know what they're doing. They mm -hmm. obviously don't know what they're doing. Right. And the val <laughs> the need for validation can be really intense. Um, you can want yeah. to be on a Comedy Central uh, special. You can be on a Netflix special. But you, you can want that validation and that can be really important. Um, but if they won't give you that, then you have to create your own validation however you need to. Did you have um, some friends that were really like a big part of your support system 
going through comedy? Oh my. oh my God. I mean, like during the darkest time, my friend Sam and I were touring these college, <laughs> we're touring these, it sounds much more glamorous than it is. It is not at all glamorous, <laughs> but like, yeah, it was good to have, a, I had a handful of comedian friends that like, really, we all knew how we, good we all really respected each other's work and supported mm -hmm. each other's work and i had a monthly show that i ran at new york comedy club that i headlined and that was so important i could cry thinking about it because at the time it was so important to me and now i look back at it like it's so silly but like at the time that every month i was doing new material for like 25 minutes and i wow. i never wow. got stage time like that wow. at that time like yeah so it's so funny because now I'll do five hours in a weekend when I'm like, I'm coming to Cobbs and doing five shows and doing five hours. But mm -hmm. every month I got to do those 25 minutes and they meant the world to me. And I just plugged the crap out of that show and sold it out. And like, if you can, you really need to have your own independent source of, of like building your craft in, in, if you're going to be an artist. Yeah, that's. That's in, that's incredible. Having a support system that understands and validates and celebrates your successes because they understand how important every single small milestone is. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. I think that's a wonderful place to end this as well. This blew by way too fast. But of course, we want to get to our promos. Um, and you're coming to San Francisco and you have some shows yes. here. So why don't you tell the people on how to find and attend your shows here. I'm coming to Cobbs in like three days. You can you can probably Google it, but the tickets, the best tickets are on Live Nation. If you go to livenation.com and just search Ashley Gavin, they'll come up. They're also on my website, ashleygavin.com. Uh, I've heard people buying them other places. Don't buy them other places. Just get them on the Cobbs website or Live Nation or my website. Um, they'll all go to Live Nation. So yeah, come through. I can't believe I'm saying Live Nation. Like, it's so crazy. <laughs> like, this whole thing is nuts. But they're gonna be so fun. And Irene too is opening for me. If you go, she, um, she's oh, local no to the Bay Area. Yeah. Awesome. So, awesome. Awesome. Yes, I've, it's gonna I've be a stuff. really stacked lineup and a lot of fun and so many gay people. So <laughs> many gay people are gonna be there. Great place to mingle to mix. I unfortunately won't be able to attend because I'll be managing our pride booth at the time but I have some people that will be going in my stead and hopefully cheering you on. And okay. also uh, <laughs> join Ashley's text list. That's how I found out that she was coming to San Francisco. Um, you can find that oh, at yeah, Ashley Oh yeah, that's on my website com. as well. Yeah, yeah. there'll Thank be you. links in the, in the description if you're watching this on YouTube and for podcasters um, in the show notes. So wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Ashley. I really appreciate this. And if I can give you a genuine compliment, your podcast helped me so much through my transition because I learned, oh, I learned so much about queer people, about relationships. I just, I saw you have, I mean, you've had about a hundred different queer people on your podcast and that was the best long form way for me to understand people of all forms. And I just truly, it's like, it's like why I wanted you here so bad is because I truly appreciate what you do. And I, I'm so mad that I can't see you in person. This has been it for Bay Area Pride. Catch us next time. You can find us on all the platforms, clips on TikTok and Instagram, full episodes on podcast platforms everywhere you can find it. Just go to pflagsf.org and you can find all the information right there.